Hello, and welcome to Western Civ, episode 159, Lost. Last time we saw how Columbus, quite miraculously, made his way across the Atlantic Ocean landing in the Bahamas. While Columbus was in no doubt disappointed in the overall lack of gold and the decided lack of Asians, we cannot ignore just how impressive his voyage was. He sailed across the Atlantic using only the most rudimentary navigational tools and a map from the 2nd century CE. And yet somehow he didn't die. Up until this point, Columbus had been shockingly lucky, at least in terms of the physical safety of his crew. Now that was about to change. The night of December 17th, 1492, saw Columbus and his crew sheltering their makeshift port in Tortuga. As the winds howled around them and the storm blew, The natives on the island at times proved no more hospitable than the wind. Those natives, it seemed, were in the midst of a war with a rival tribe, a tribe of cannibals, no less. Columbus listened to the gruesome tales of the ongoing war, only to question the chief continuously. Sure, got it. Cannibals, yeah, bad. But where's the gold? Once more, the chief promised that there was gold nearby, but when the time came, he couldn't produce any. Frustrated and not interested in this inter-tribe conflict, Columbus promptly weighed anchor and made for Lombardo Cove in modern-day Haiti. There, Columbus made contact with a friendlier tribe of natives who gladly showed him their village. For the first time, Columbus marveled at what he saw. Quote, the inhabitants make their houses of wood and straw in the form of a bell. They were very high and spacious, such that ten or more persons lived in each one. They drove in the big poles, as big as a leg or even a thigh in circle, half the height of a person into the earth and close together. They were all joined together at the top, where they were tied with a certain core of roots that were called bellicos. With these roots and the bark of the trees of a black color and other bark stripped off remained white, they made lattice work with designs and foliage like paintings on the inside of a building. Others were adorned with striped reeds that appeared very white. There were very thin and delicate canes, end quote. Having decided there was nothing to fear, Columbus sent a party of six into the village and tried to explain to the tribe that they were not the, quote, men who came from the sky, but rather that they were there in the service of the king and queen of Spain. On Saturday, December 22nd, Columbus again attempted to leave the harbor in an effort to find gold. But the four weather drove him back. It was an ominous sign of things to come. The next day, he again set sail looking for gold ignoring the traditional religious taboo about setting out on the Lord's Day. On Christmas Eve, Columbus reached land and there heard what he thought was the word Simpango from one of the natives, Simpango being Marco Polo's word for Japan. Suddenly, Columbus thought he was very near Asia. The guide compounded the problem by telling him that there was so much gold where they were going that the chiefs beat their banners out of the substance. By 11 p.m. on Christmas Eve, the ship, native guide in tow, was sailing easily on a gentle breeze. Columbus decided to take a nap. In spite of the prohibition, Columbus left a boy of only 14 years old to steer the ship. Quote, As it was calm, the seamen who steered the ship decided to go to sleep and hand over the tiller to the ship's boy, 
which the Admiral had always strictly forbidden during the entire voyage, come wind, come calm, namely, that they should never let the ship's boy steer. End quote. Suddenly, and with a deafening thud, the ship stopped dead in its tracks. Columbus tore up out of his sleeping quarters and screamed at the man who should have been in charge. What they did not realize was that the Santa Maria had just run aground on not one but three coral reefs. Panicking, Columbus ordered everyone to the longboats. They rowed to the Nina, but those aboard the Nina would not allow Columbus and his men aboard, realizing that the Nina might not be able to accommodate everyone on the voyage home. Frustrated, Columbus rowed back. He ordered the sails unloaded and tried to lighten the ship as much as possible to try to move it. All of this was to no avail. The ship would not budge. Columbus spent the rest of the night in a state of near-constant panic. Once the dawn broke, he dispatched a group of men to try to find a local native chief with whom Columbus had previously been on favorable terms. Luckily for Columbus, the Tainos came without delay and worked throughout Christmas to unload the goods aboard the Santa Maria, which was wrecked. To Columbus, the whole thing had the feel of a Christmas miracle about it. He wrote passionately at the time about his love and appreciation of the natives who had just saved his skin. Quote, All are people of love and without greed, and suitable for every purpose. I assure your highness that in all the world, there is no better people nor better country. They love their neighbors as themselves and have the sweetest talk in the world and gentle and always with a smile as their mothers bore them with very good manners. End quote. Sadly, he did not envision these new natives as partners in this new Spanish empire. Rather, to Columbus, they seemed to behave as perfect servants or slaves and assured them that they could provide the bedrock of labor needed to sustain Spain's overall colonies in, well, wherever this was. To protect his new empire as this idea was quickly taking shape in his mind, Columbus became obsessed now with the idea that he had to have a fort. A fort would send a message. The wrecked Santa Maria, he assumed, was destroyed by God just for this purpose, so that he could build a fort. The remnants of the Santa Maria would become Spain's first fort in the New World. Before, his goal was to move quickly from place to place, but no more. Now Columbus writing, quote, Now I have given orders to erect a tower and a fortress, all very well done, and a great moat, not that I believe it necessary, for these people, for I take for granted that with these people I could conquer all this island, which I believe no larger than Portugal, and double its number of inhabitants. End quote. His goal was no longer to boast that he could sail from Spain to China, but that he erected a beacon of light in the wilderness. Wealth would flow to Spain still, but it would do so over a connected trade network that he would manage, and of which this would be the first ever outpost. It was both an audacious and calculatedly self-serving decision. By leaving men in the New World in a fort he built for Spain, Columbus was virtually guaranteeing that he would need to come back. Ferdinand and Isabella would not be able to supplant him. He could not possibly be expected to leave Spaniards to die in the wilderness, could he? Of course not. And given that Columbus was the only person who would know exactly where this fort was, well, the Spanish monarchs would not be able to supplant him from his position and, of course, still claim to be the Catholic sovereigns 
they had been so recently named. Ferdinand and Isabella would have no choice. If his plan worked, they'd have to send him back. While he was planning, the natives brought Columbus another piece of good news. The Pinta was anchored at a river nearby, right about where he currently was. Now recall that Captain Pinzon, suffering from syphilis, had previously absconded with the Pinta and its crew. Playing real politique, Columbus dispatched a hasty letter of reconciliation to Pinzon, hoping to make use of the Pinta's resources. After all, Columbus's first voyage was reaching its conclusion, and the last thing he needed was Pinzon pulling up anchor and getting back to Spain first, with the news of Columbus wrecking one of his three ships. Yet to Columbus's dismay, Pinzon was having none of it. He departed, leaving Columbus with one ship only. Columbus was left with few options. Finally, he determined that he would leave 20 men behind, or a few more, to man this new fort, quote-unquote, which definitely still had to be built, by the way. With only the Nina remaining, Columbus would depart himself on January the 2nd, 1493. He sailed windward along the northern coast of Hispaniola, now treading very carefully lest another unseen coral reef shatter his remaining ship. Oddly, and this fact now definitely bolsters the idea that Pinzon was suffering from a mental illness. Pinzon now shows up and begins to follow the Nina. The two ships find a safe anchorage and drop anchor. There, Pinzon comes aboard and begs forgiveness for leaving Columbus, saying he only did so against his will, which is absurd, obviously. Columbus was angry, but what could he do? He declared Pinzon's actions traitorous, but then prepared to simply sail on with the captain, given that he still needed him to get home. With two ships now, Columbus decided to weigh anchor and make repairs to the Nina before continuing the journey. As his men did so, he continued to entertain all kinds of fanciful rumors about rivers of gold and cities of gold and ponds of gold. At one point, he sent his men out to search, only to have them come back with the tiniest of nuggets. Once the ship was ready to go, he set sail again before stopping around the modern-day Dominican Republic. There, he took celestial measurements and determined it was January 13th, 1493. Yet, by January 15th, Columbus had still not left. Why? Well, the answer seems to be that Columbus realized he was not returning with the buckets of gold that he said he would. Sure, he could claim to have discovered new lands, but in truth, he had no idea where they were and they were certainly not covered in gold. Thus, he again took some natives aboard the ship and questioned them about gold, while sending out yet more search parties still looking for the same. Again, no one found anything. Instead, Columbus noted the abundance of cotton and peppers on the island, hoping that those valuable commodities might make up for the clear lack of precious metals. Columbus then noted the thick mats of seaweed that clogged the harbor. Not understanding at all where he was, he assumed that these were in some way connected to the Canary Islands, which he believed were only 400 leagues distant. In reality, he was about twice that far from the island chain. The drifting seawood was actually brown algae, called Sargassum. Sargassum is what gives the Sargasso Sea its name. Almost one million square miles, the Sargasso Sea lies just east of the Caribbean Sea, where the drifting algae actually does little to impede the progress of ships, contrary to the concerns that Columbus voiced at the time. On January 16, 1493, Columbus finally commenced his homeward passage. 
It was just a few hours before dawn and the two remaining Spanish ships, the Nina and the Pinta, were going home. Less the 20 or more men remaining in the quote-unquote fort. After traveling 64 miles, Columbus caught the headwind that he believed would take him all the way to Spain. Unfortunately for him, what awaited them in Spain and the Portuguese islands in between would prove just as daunting than what he had just experienced in the Caribbean. Columbus's return voyage is especially hard to tabulate in terms of dates. This is for several reasons. First, Columbus did not reckon time like most early modern mariners who started their days at noon. Columbus began at dawn on the outbound voyage, but then he switched to sunset, to sunset on the homebound journey. It's maddeningly frustrating, of course, that he switched midway through. Moreover, medieval clocks did not work aboard a ship, so Columbus used an hourglass device called an ampotella. But this device was far from accurate. Some days, Columbus was able to make corrections by reckoning when the sun reached its zenith. At other times, the ampotella was completely out of whack. Columbus also tried to observe the traditional canonical schedule while at sea. Prime at 6 a.m., Terce at 9 a.m., Sext at noon, Nons at 3 p.m., Vespers at 6, and Compline at 9 p.m. Sadly, Columbus's inability to correctly reckon time while on board, not his fault, by the way, meant that these observations were normally skewed. Early on, Columbus's crew was optimistic that the voyage would be shockingly quick, and I mean shockingly. On January 18th, hardly two days into the trip, the sight of some birds convinced those on board that they were approaching Spain. Evidently, they had all forgotten that it had taken them over 20 days to reach the New World. Columbus continued varying his course between north and northeast. The weather grew colder and the crew sighted many birds and fish, but still no sign of land. Such was how the trip continued for the balance of January and into February. On Saturday, February 3rd, Columbus tried the Astrolab and the Quadrant, hoping that these rudimentary devices might help him to find the right course. He needed to sight the North Star and the devices to use them. And eventually, well, he just gave up, blaming the choppy waters. Though more likely to blame was Columbus's own inability to accurately use the instruments. Soon he gave up on the devices and determined to sail merely with his innate navigational skills. After all, they hadn't failed him yet. The trade winds quickly drove the Nina on, covering 200 nautical miles in 24 hours on February 6th. Soon the crew and Columbus became convinced that they were nearing the Azores. In fact, Columbus reckoned that he was about 75 miles south of the island chain. In reality, he was about 600 miles east and 200 miles south of where he thought he was. The longer that Columbus remained at sea without sighting land, the more the danger grew. The outbound journey, I mean, that was really a test of vision. The inbound journey was the test of navigational skill. Now he was sailing towards a firm location that he knew, Spain. Not some fanciful notion of where Marco Polo's Japan might be. And once again, he was lost without realizing it. During the return voyage, Columbus spent most of his time preparing a detailed summary 
of his exploits for the queen's keeper of the privy purse to pass on to the sovereigns. He realized, likely, he might need to deal with Pinzon yet, and there was still the question of how the Portuguese were going to interpret all this. Thus, Columbus was busy preparing his defense. Columbus's letter on the first voyage attempted to accentuate the positive and eliminate any negative aspects of the expedition. You know, like, um, no great con didn't find one. Instead, he wrote, quote, Since I know you will be pleased at the great success which the Lord has crowned my voyage, I write to inform you how in 33 days I crossed from the Canary Islands to the Indies with the fleet our most illustrious sovereigns gave to me, and I there found many islands filled with people without number, and of them I have taken possession for their highness by proclamation and with the royal standard displayed and nobody objected, end quote. He tried to strike a balance between being a salesman and being a secret agent. Amazingly, he decided to just bluff on where he had gone, and though in reality he had no clue, quote, to the first island which I found I gave the name Saint Salvador in recognition of his heavenly majesty, who marvelously hath given all this. The Indians call it Guanahani. To the second, I gave the name Aile de Santa Maria de Concepcion. To the third, Ferdinanda. To the fourth, Isabella. To the fourth, Juana. And to each one, I gave a new name. End quote. He tried to strike a balance between being a salesman and being a secret agent. Columbus still had to worry about being replaced, after all. So he was guarded in his reports as to the actual whereabouts of the main islands, and very guarded about the relocation of the port. He portrayed Hispaniola as the linchpin in an overseas Spanish empire. Quote, It has many large harbors finer than any I know in Christian lands, and many large rivers. All this is marvelous. Hispaniola itself is a wonderful, with many incredibly fine harbors and great rivers, many spices, and large mines of gold and other metals. End quote. Obviously, many of those are gross exaggerations or just complete falsities. One can imagine Columbus calmly sailing on, totally lost in both the ocean and in his own imagination as he wrote descriptions that he hoped would justify a return trip. His descriptions of the Tainos he had encountered are fascinating and somewhat bipolar at times. They love Westerners and they worship them as gods. They hate him and they shoot arrows at him. They try to give him a golden statue of himself. They are savage. If you are asking yourself how they are so savage, but they have metallurgical skills to fashion a life-sized golden Columbus, well, you know, so am I. Generalizations of these people that he found he determined were difficult to give, but you know what? He still tried. Quote, they all go naked, men and women, as their mothers bore them, except that some women cover one place only with the leaf of a plant or a net of cotton. They have no iron or steel weapons, nor are they capable of using them, although they are well-built people of handsome stature, because they are wondrously timid. They are people without number. Even a father would not stay for his son, and this is not because wrong had been done to anyone. If anything, and of anything, they have, if you ask them for it, they never say no. Rather, they invite the person to share it and show as much love as if they were giving their hearts, and whether the thing be of value or of some small price, end quote. Of course, Columbus was not going to ignore his number one sales pitch for the natives. They can be converted to Christianity. Quote, I gave them a thousand pretty things that I had brought in order to gain their love and incline them to be Christians. I hope to win them to the love and the service of their highness. 
and of the whole Spanish nation, and to persuade them to collect and to give us of things which they possessed in abundance and which we needed. End quote. One phrase, however, he repeated over and over again. The natives, quote, believe very firmly that I, with these ships and people, came from the sky. And everywhere he went, he was greeted with the call, quote, and end quote, come and see the people from the sky. Every page dripped with embellishment. He proclaimed he had found the gold mines of the great Khan, when in reality he had found a few nuggets of gold in a river. He had built a citadel in the new world. Nope. He built a ramshackle fort out of the scuttled remains of the Santa Maria and left 30-odd men to make the best of it. But the image itself was designed to conjure up dreams of conquest for Isabella and Ferdinand not to be real. Finally, he bestowed the name on the people he found that has stuck with us ever since. Indios. Because remember, he was in India, right? Anyone who read between the lines of these reports would quickly realize that Columbus was very short on details and come to the conclusion that some of this was clearly exaggeration. But that, he hoped, maybe that would be after a return voyage. At least after one was greenlit. On Sunday, February the 10th, 1493, Columbus and his crew again saw signals, birds, plants, that they believed meant that they were closing in on Spain. They were not. These were signs of land, but the ships were approaching the Azores, not Spain. Just then a massive storm blew up. Columbus ordered the main sails struck and tried to ride out the storm. To his horror, the Nina lost sight of the Pinta, which was likewise tempest-tossed by the waves. But Columbus could not worry about the Pinta right now. He just needed to survive the night. Ultimately, he sailed northeast by east through the storm over six hours, desperate to escape the crashing force of the waves. By the 16th of February, it seemed that the worst of the massive storm was over, and Columbus made for north-northeast. There they came upon a mysterious island, which today historians believe was St. Michael in the Azores. By Sunday evening, Columbus finally dropped anchor, having made it to Santa Maria, another of the Azores. The Nina, at least, was safe. At least his guess they had made it to the Azores proved correct. Oddly, Columbus wanted to brag about his exploits to the Portuguese on the island, but Columbus couldn't find anyone who would listen. The Portuguese saw Columbus as an Italian trespasser. Nothing less, nothing more. Only the Spanish would be interested in his tales. On Thursday, February 21st, Columbus found himself again tossed by the same unrelenting storm as he tried to make his way around the Azores. Failing to find the Pinta, he returned to the port of Santa Maria, only to have his ship boarded by five armed men who demanded to see his papers from the Spanish king and queen. A fight actually broke out between the Portuguese men and the Spanish sailors, until Columbus finally defused the situation, convinced the men that he had a right to be there, and continued on his way. Four days later, the storm finally abated temporarily, it would seem, and the ship was able to sail on. But then, the storm returned, and began to blow Columbus not towards Spain, but towards the one place in the world he truly did not want to go. Lisbon, Portugal. The same place he swore he would never return to. On March 4th, Columbus and his exhausted crew sighted land. It was Europe, finally. Sadly, the rock that he saw was the rock of Sintra on the Tagus River, which flows into Lisbon. Columbus had survived two ocean passages and a shipwreck, only to fall into the clutches of King Jao of Portugal once more. 
but he had no choice. His ship needed to dock. So he sailed to Lisbon where he was promptly detained. In one of those crazy history moments, the man who boarded the Nina was none other than Bartolomeu Dias, the famous Portuguese explorer who had discovered the Cape of Good Hope and who was now the master of Portuguese ships. Dias initially demanded that Columbus come on shore and give a complete report of what he had done and where he had gone. Columbus wasn't having it and refused. Dias then demanded his second command come ashore and do the same. Columbus refused. Finally, Dias relented and asked for the papers of authorization from Ferdinand and Isabella, which, for the record... Columbus offered to show him in the first place. Then he came aboard, spoke with Columbus, and inspected his cargo. All of that was expected. By March the 6th, Columbus was the talk of Lisbon, and his exploits, though totally misunderstood by everyone, were everywhere. Then, as expected, came a letter from King Zhao II. Columbus was quote-unquote, invited to a royal audience. This invitation was not something that Columbus was allowed to refuse. Now, all this was going to be a tricky affair for Columbus. The Portuguese were likely to try to get as much information as possible out of him. He wanted to keep as much secret as he could. Moreover, this... What was it? New Island? New something? Where was it exactly? For as Zhao was quick to point out, did Columbus not know about the Treaty of Alvacavos? In this 1479 agreement, the line of demarcation ran between Cape Verde and the Canary Islands, roughly through Mauritania. It seemed, based on descriptions, that Columbus's islands were south, and that... that would make them Portuguese, not Spanish. Columbus deferred and demurred. He protested that Ferdinand and Isabella were aware of the treaty, and expressly told him to avoid Guinea and its islands and to stay north of the line. Which, by the way, maybe unbeknownst to him, he had definitely crossed. But given the paucity of information, other than a ton of boasting, that Columbus was willing to give Zhao, there was little that the king could do. Now comes an interesting historical what if, though. Sources report that Zhao was furious at himself for dismissing Columbus, but now he saw a way to rectify the mistake. He could murder Columbus, or have him murdered right now. If he acted quickly and seized the crew, then Ferdinand and Isabella might assume he was lost at sea. Surely, one of Columbus's men could be bribed to show someone else the way. All this glory, all this discovery of the new world, it might yet go to Portugal. However, for whatever reason, we may never know, King Zhao relented and released Columbus. We'll never know if he regretted it. On March the 15th, 1493, Columbus returned to the harbor he left on August the 3rd, 1492. He planned to proceed to Barcelona by sea and then to court. He had done it. He had been shrewd and wily, but most importantly, spectacularly lucky. He wrote to Ferdinand and Isabella upon making landfall, quote, Since I know that you will be pleased at the great success with which the Lord has crowned my voyage, I wrote to inform you how in 33 days I crossed from the Canary Islands to the Indies with the fleet which our most illustrious sovereigns gave to me. I found very many islands, 
with large populations, and took possession of them all for your highnesses. This I did by proclamation, and unfurled the royal standard. End quote. He had done it. Unbeknownst to Columbus, he had just changed the world forever. Just not in the way he had thought. If you're interested in more content, check out the website. You have all of the history of Western thought available. And if you're interested in even more content, including bonus episodes that are not available anywhere else, consider becoming a patron. For as little as $1 a month, you can support the show and gain access to early episodes, plus ultimately all the bonus content available. Check it out at Patreon forward slash Western Civ Podcast. Podcast.